Welcome back to Southeast Asia Radio. This week, we're covering the Singaporean vessel that collided with the Baltimore Key Bridge and the passage of a landmark bill legalizing same-sex marriage in Thailand. We'll also cover droughts and haze in Malaysia and a tycoon crackdown in Cambodia. I'm Jafet Kitsan. And I'm Lauren Mai. Today is April 4th, 2024, and on this week's interview... I see 1027 as a culmination of much longer processes following the coup and are an indication of the extent to which a range of anti-military, anti-regime forces in the country, armed political, national level, if you will, or subnational as well. That was Nyanta Lin. Greg and Alina had him on to discuss the latest developments in Myanmar. But before that, let's start with the headlines. Hi, Jaffet. We have a lot on the agenda for today's episode. Yes, yes, we do. For our first story, we'll turn to news that dominated American headlines this past week. Early on Tuesday, March 26th, a cargo ship lost power and collided with the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, Maryland, causing it to collapse entirely. Much has already been reported on the tragedy from the American perspective, with at least six people presumed dead, several hospitalized, and one of the busiest ports on the East Coast now closed for business. But the vessel, called the Dali, is owned by Singapore-based transport company Grace Ocean and operated by Singapore-based Synergy Marine. The accident attracted attention from officials in the city-state. They launched an investigation of the bridge collapse to determine whether any Singaporean laws were broken in the process. Dali is required by Singapore law to comply with both international and Singapore-specific rules, as well as regulations on maritime safety and security, marine environmental protection, and social, living, and working conditions on board. Right. The city-state's Transport Safety Investigation Bureau will also carry out a separate probe to identify lessons to prevent future marine casualties and incidents. Singapore will work closely with the U.S. Coast Guard and agencies to fully support the investigations. All right. Next, we'll cross over to Malaysia, where extreme droughts and air pollution have persisted over the past few days. Droughts in Malaysia's eastern state, Sabah, made worse by old, failing water infrastructure, have caused taps to run dry since mid-February in one district southwest of the state capital, Kota Kinabalu. At the same time, Sabah is experiencing unhealthy levels of air quality amid soaring temperatures. Similarly dangerous air pollution index readings were also measured in Selangor Pahang in West Malaysia. Malaysia has been particularly impacted by climate catastrophes this year, as the ongoing El Nino weather phenomenon expedited the start of Malaysia's hot and dry season. To read more, I encourage you to check out my piece on Transboundary Haze for more details. It's a really good piece. But yeah, last week, 47 areas in all states in Malaysia, except for one, were under a heat wave alert. We'll have to keep track on that. For our next story, Thailand is one step closer to becoming the first country in Southeast Asia to legalize same-sex marriage. Yep. The Thai Senate on Tuesday overwhelmingly approved the first read of a bill guaranteeing marriage rights for gay and lesbian couples. The landmark legislation seeks to change the official legal status from husband and wife to married individuals. After overwhelmingly passing the first round of votes with 147 out of 158 in favor, the bill now heads to a panel committee for review. After a final vote in July, it moves to the king. If approved, the bill will take effect 120 days later. Recent legislative decisions on same-sex marriage are a hopeful sign for Prime Minister Sata as his administration vows to push ahead with a progressive social agenda. Right. This bill was one of his big platform promises. And moving forward, other reforms may include legislation to recognize gender identity, legalize prostitution and commercial surrogacy, as well as allow LGBTQ couples to adopt children. Thailand is also seeking to host the World Pride events in Bangkok in 2028 in a potential boost for Thailand's tourism industry. Well, that's a super exciting development. For our final headline, we turn to Cambodia, where a 35-year-old businesswoman, Leng Chana, has been arrested after she allegedly swindled investors out of hundreds of millions of dollars. Yikes. Earlier this month, Chana was charged with fraud and money laundering, as well as being stripped of her Okinya title. And what is Okinya, Jaffet? It's basically a synonym for tycoon. The Okinya title has an honorific meaning of lord or duke and is given to those who donate at least 500000 to the government. Let's hope that she didn't use her investors' money to pay that 500000 to the government, because thousands of families are saying they lost large sums to China's real estate projects. Uh-oh, that's not a good look. Definitely not. In the grand scheme of things, China's arrest comes as Hun Manet's government tries to project an image of good governance amid citizens' growing frustration with the tycoon class, which has become notorious for land grabbing, money laundering, and connections to human trafficking. 
Currently, an estimated 1,500 tycoons hold the Okinya title, which was initially intended to honor people who gave to charity and public works. But at least six Okinya, including Chana, who received the title between 2019 and 2020, have since been arrested or publicly accused of illegal activities. Sounds to me like the Okinya system might need some revisions. Just a few, right? Yeah. And those are the headlines. Up next, Greg and Alina's interview with Nianta Lin. Stay tuned. Welcome back to South Asia Radio, everybody. As always, I'm your host, Greg Poling with CSIS, joined by co-host Alina Noor with the Carnegie Endowment. Hey, Alina. Hey, hey, Greg. And today we're joined by Nyanta Lin. Nyanta is the principal for the Anagat Initiative and a longtime consultant, analyst, expert on all things Myanmar. And Nyanta is here to talk to us about an update now more than three years after the coup in, in Myanmar. Nyanta, thanks so much for coming on. Great to be here, Greg. Thank you. So can I ask for the benefit of the listeners, why don't we just start with some of your background in bona fides? How'd you, how'd you come to this work? And what have you been doing, um, particularly since the coup? Great. For the past 15 plus years, I've been working in Myanmar. I worked in government affairs. I ran the office for a regional Southeast Asia focused GR agency. I've worked in agriculture. I have provided advisory services to the public sector and the private sector in the country. And especially following the coup, a lot of my work is on providing analysis and insights to various clientele, supporting any kind of opportunities to promote and facilitate dialogue between domestic stakeholders and various efforts to push out support as well to various creatives that are still trying to operate inside and outside the country. Can I just ask if Anaga means anything? Yeah, Anaga means the future, actually, in Burmese. It came about a few years before the coup when we started a few friends and myself who have worked in and around the policy space in the country saw the need to essentially create a forum for both dialogue, thought leadership, bringing in different kinds of domain experts from inside and outside the country through various policy forums, uh, salons, and gatherings. Yanta, we've been introduced, I think, early in the post-coup period and have exchanged thoughts a few times. I find you to be one of the more insightful and candid voices that I can talk to with a deep network still in country in, in Myanmar. And we saw each other last a couple of weeks ago. I don't recall if this was on Chatham House Rule or off the record, so I'm just going to say we saw each other in Washington. And it was the first time I think we've spoken since Operation 1027 last October, in which we had the Northern Alliance, Brotherhood Alliance of Armed Ethnic Groups. Myanmar launched this somewhat surprising and surprisingly successful offensive that I think many, myself included, feel was a turning point. I mean, it may not have been the thing that will lead to the junta's defeat. But I think for those who who continued to hold on to this belief that inevitably the junta would have battlefield victory and return to the status quo ante, that has been shattered in the last few months. How do you assess both the battlefield dynamics and I guess broadly the political situation within the country now, I suppose, four months or so after Operation 1027? Great question, Greg. I see 1027 as a culmination of much longer processes following the coup and are an indication of the extent to which a range of anti-military, anti-regime forces in the country, armed political, national level, if you will, or subnational as well, and the extent to which and the depth to which they have been in engagement with each other, in conversation with each other, and their ability to pull off a very significant level of cooperation. It's also an indication of the extent to which the military has fallen from its former perceived status as the dominant actor and uh, the extent to which its perceived monopoly on force no longer holds true. So for me, 1027 it, as an event is, is significant and as we've seen in recent weeks, does not look like a one-off. I 
am still, not to be flippant or anything, but I'm still hung up on the term policy salon that Nyanta you use. It just sounds so elegant. But getting back to the seriousness of our conversation, would you see that 1027 has in fact set in motion the recent development leading up to this forced conscription of young folks in Myanmar, both men and women? It's very hard to assess just what is really going on on the ground. And all the reports that we've been seeing, at least in the international media, have uh, pointed to the military just losing quite a significant amount of territory in many places. Are we just reading wishful thoughts about what is really happening in Myanmar? Or are we really seeing some of the benefits that have come to accrue since 1027? That's a great question, Alina. I think if you look at the military, there has been this consistent perception, and primarily because of more exposure over the past decade leading up to the coup, with a particular kind of leadership in the military, and then outside of the military made up of uh, former military senior officers, that suggests that this was a much more politically astute, evolving organization. But I think what the coup has triggered is, again, a reversion to its core institutional interests, right? And this has always been a concern for those of us that work in Myanmar, that work on Myanmar. We've never doubted that there was a point where there was a confluence of different interests that suggested the previous generation of leadership within the military was desiring some kind of change, some kind of transition out of direct military rule. But what the coup now shows is that when push comes to shove, they will ultimately revert back to the survival of the military as an organization, as a political and armed actor in the country above all else. So if you look at the conscription law, it's triggered a whole host of problems for industry, right? And it's not the kind of signal you want to send to your neighbors, to the international community, to indicate that you are willing and able to consider exits or moves away from this current disastrous path. The conscription law in our understanding from a range of sources, both around the military, around the, the bureaucratic apparatus in Nebiro, suggests that this was an option that was always in play. If we look back at the law, this is a law that was drafted many years ago, actually, under the previous military administration. And it's only being pulled into uh, force under this current commander in chief. So it's always been available. And the question is, why are they bringing it into effect now? And ultimately, it's, again, pointing to a regime intent on its own survival, but also pressed in that sense. They have not been able to, again, push back on what is now a nationwide uprising. They have, since 1027, and I would argue even before then, consistently failed to meet a very young, emergent, and inexperienced armed resistance movement that nevertheless has gained ground and has gained experience and has won in very tactical and strategic fashion in different parts of the country, primarily because of the support of more experienced armed actors, the ethnic armed or ethnic revolutionary or ethnic resistance organizations in the country, the terminology, depending on who you talk to, but also the sheer willingness, right, of these PDFs, these People's Defense Forces, to truly meet the, the military in combat. The conscription law then is an attempt to do a few things in my reading. It is an attempt to garner the manpower that I believe the military is lacking to seriously hold off and meet the resistance. It's also an attempt to cower the public in a very crude and I would argue ineffective way. If anything, it's driven the public already disgusted with the military further away. And finally, it, it, it again, it lays clear its priorities. It does not care what the garment industry thinks, right? Because this is going to drive out whatever remains of Myanmar's labor-intensive 
industries to escape this potential forced conscription. It's clear that at this point, they are going to prioritize the war. And I'm not so sure in a way that they can do so successfully. Any attempt or any pretense at governance, any pretense at a restoration of stability or some kind of economic certainty in the country is no longer really a concern. Nyanta, obviously developments in the battlefield are moving very quickly. We're recording on March 18th. This won't air until the very beginning of April. So I have no idea what will change in the two weeks between now and then. I know something will change. But as we sit here, since Operation 1027, the Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army, the Kokong, have consolidated control of all the Kokong special region under a ceasefire brokered by China. The Ta'ang National Liberation Army, which is their ally, has expanded control of what they deem to be a Ta'ang homeland, which may bring them into some tensions and conflict with other ethnic resistance actors. Kachin Independence Army has launched a new offensive in Kachin State that's having great success. And maybe most explosively, the Arakan Army looks poised to take Sitwe, which would be the first state-level capital, and maybe Chokpu, the special economic zone and port, which hosts China's Shui gas pipelines, terminal for the Shui gas pipelines. This is all pretty momentous. So now you have multiple actors who are either expanding or consolidating their own governance frameworks in different parts of the country. We've also, I didn't mention, they didn't have great battlefield success, but both the Qin and the Karani since 1027 have launched their own constitutions and set up their, let's call them transitional governing bodies. So as you look ahead to potential political coalitions, political settlements, do you have any idea what this fractious governance landscape looks like a few years out and how how all of these actors who so far have been pushing in the same direction because they all have a shared enemy, how do they take the next step and agree or you know, at least agree on the mission of a federal post junta Myanmar? That is the key question. I think that remains to be answered. But I will only say that there are a number of ongoing processes and mechanisms that facilitate the kind of, I think, trust building and communication that was not possible, arguably, under previous periods in the country. The peace process that we saw for the past decade under two quasi-civilian and then civilian administrations were also unable to truly achieve major breakthroughs aside from a ceasefire agreement with some of the larger groups, but not all. And the reason for that is the political space, I think, for inter-ethnic, inter-actor dialogue has always been constrained. And this is in part because of a military and political strategy by successive military governments and regimes from the center to prevent that kind of space from emerging. During this period, in the post-coup environment, you have seen both emergent platforms for subnational communication, dialogue, even cooperation. You're seeing this in Kareni, you're seeing this maybe a couple of different platforms in, in Chin, and so on and so forth elsewhere. There are platforms such as the National Unity Consultative Council that have attempted to bring together an even more disparate group of stakeholders, not just armed actors in the country, but also protest groups, civil society, even civil servants, the hundreds of thousands of civil servants that have gone on strike through their own representative mechanisms are part of these consultative efforts tasked with looking at things not just now, but for a future Myanmar. And then at a very operational level of cooperation, you have different frameworks between the NUG and some of the key EROs that preserve both the channels of communication and enable the kind of trust that wasn't there before. And then I would argue also have resulted in are part of the reason you've seen the kind of battlefield success that was deemed impossible up until the past year or so. The key thing is that these mechanisms are there, these platforms, these four are there, and that the key organizations and the key actors preserve the space for that kind of engagement. And from my 
conversations with some of the different representatives, decision makers, advisors across this entire landscape, I think you can say there's a willingness. The key thing is that the classic tension is to what extent do the different local level conflicts fit into a countrywide political framework, right? And what I mean by that is in Myanmar, it's not just about the dominant Bama majority and, and minority groups, the many minority groups that, ha- that exist uh, across the country, but it's also some of the issues that exist between them as almost a microcosm of what's happening countrywide. And then the tensions that have existed past and present between the various armed and political organizations that claim to represent the different ethnic communities. If the groups can commit to a process and there's been willingness, right? Even the fact that the peace process we talked about over the past two administrations, the fact that you saw willingness even during that period, unfortunately did not get far, at least indicates there is the space to continue. And if anything, the consistent message from key organizations, I think KNU leadership has mentioned this, uh, the KIA as well, KIOK as well, as of course the NUG and the MPs and CRPH. But everybody has made clear it's the role of the military that has prevented and blocked the kind of across the aisle conversation Myanmar needs. By addressing the military first, there is a commitment being made to continuing a peaceful process of dialogue and discussion to resolve the issues after. Are there concrete examples of that? I would say yes. There have been attempts to mediate small territorial disputes that exist in northern Shan, right? There are channels of communication that are being put into play to address issues between key actors in Chin and Rakhine, and so on and so forth. Now, a lot of this is not public, but at least there is an effort being made. I'm always an optimist in this sense. I think where you have the means and then where you have the willingness with the right kind of enablement and the right kind of encouragement, the chances are good. Let's put it that way. Well, let me tack on to this question of the day after scenario. Where do the Rohingya fit in? As we're recording this, my understanding is that all sorts of benefits are being dangled in front of the Rohingya community to be a part of this conscripted, boosted military, uh, including, as I understand it, citizenship ID cards, if I'm not mistaken. Are, Are they a piece of this puzzle at all? Everybody has to be. What's clear is that whatever's from offer from the military, I'm not so sure about the credibility because alongside what you're saying in terms of the dangling of incentives, what we're also hearing are the sticks, right? So in the past week, there are indications of forcible conscription of the Rohingya by the same Burmese military, right? Accused of attacking their villages, burning down their villages, and forcing the immense tragedy and suffering we saw most recently in late 2017. It is the same military that is forcibly conscripting them and deploying them to the front line. You are beginning to see and hear of battlefield casualties of the Rohingya forced or pressed into what are essentially human shield roles. I do not think they are being trained and armed to fight. I believe they're serving as human shields. And I believe as we hear more of what's actually happening in the coming days and weeks, because the early indication is the, that is exactly what's happening. Now, where they fit in the Myanmar context, putting aside the Burmese military, I think you will see that all the key political actors that are present and active during this period are agreed on one thing, right? There needs to be a overhaul of not just the constitution and the system of government that Myanmar has, but in this discussion of systems change, we have to deal with the issue of citizenship in Myanmar. Myanmar has always had a tiered and hugely discriminatory form of citizenship in the country. You will have many groups call out the problematic nature of the entire national races construct in the country's political and regulatory regime. And there is a commitment from key actors made 
to overhaul these systems. I think with the right kind of support, and by support, it's it's also technical, and it's also space, right? The space to to address some of this, you will see the kind of progress I think that needs to have take place. With the Rohingya, it's also a multi-level problem. And one of the interesting dynamics I think we're witnessing is in private conversation, other key actors in Rakhine do not want to see and do not want the Rohingya issue to be treated as a Rakhine only issue, right? But as a Myanmar issue, which in itself is a indicator and a signal to the space desired for a future national dialogue. And again, from that, I would at least count that as a signal of political will. Nanta, given the very dynamic nature of the battlefield, right? The various EROs are winning across the periphery of the country. It seems like the military, the junta has gone into self-preservation mode. They, at least men on flying and senior generals, seem to view this as existential. Do you see space for dialogue right now and i mean i guess to show my cards by the way i asked the question i worry that what we're seeing from much of the international community in particular myanmar's neighbors is almost a naivete that they can find some kind of clever way to engage and end this violence in the middle of a revolution and revolutions don't end because somebody came up with a clever dialogue i don't see any evidence at any side is in the mood to negotiate at the moment. I think that's right. The history of the Burmese military when it comes to dialogue and negotiations is well documented. And all the key actors we're talking about that are resisting the military during this period are very familiar with the precedent. So in effect, it isn't about ruling out dialogue, but it's about the fact that at the moment there does not seem to be the right kind of signaling, the right kind of willingness, nor the right kind of space. And space, really, I would agree with you, is probably the least problematic part of it. Ultimately, when the commander-in-chief that started the coup, that initiated the coup, that has overseen the disastrous mismanagement or deliberate dismanagement, one can argue, of the country since the coup, and is responsible for the deaths and violence we've seen during this period. If he remains at the head of the organization, I'm not so sure any of the actors would see any kind of credibility. And there's no way to sell it to the public, right, ultimately in Myanmar, unless there is that kind of leadership change. The one thing I'll say is I think within the military, there is awareness of that. There are reasons to believe at a decision-making or decision-influencing level, there is awareness of that problem. Now, ultimately, it's for the military to figure out how to resolve that issue and the kind of signaling they want to do and the kind of positioning they want to take vis-a-vis other actors. But the at that point in time when they are ready, I think there is experience on all sides. And I think there's also familiarity, right, at the level of the international community over the past decade plus before the coup in knowing how to create the right kind of environment and inducements for that kind of dialogue. But at present, it would be difficult to see that taking place until there is that initial first step at a minimum. All right, Nyanta, you brought up the international community. I have to ask you about ASEAN and kind of the fractures within ASEAN that we're seeing Maybe even more prolifically now, given recent happenings with Laos's chairmanship and the fact that at the recent ASEAN Foreign Minister's meeting retreat, there was representation from the junta, the Myanmar junta at that meeting. I know there's been a lot of consternation about ASEAN and its role in trying to resolve the crisis. What are your thoughts on this? Do you see any role for ASEAN at all or are we too far gone? Let's put it this way. I think enough of the other influential powers in the region have at least indicated a desire to see ASEAN remain the main forum during this period. That always creates the space for a return to relevance for ASEAN. 
But in putting it that way, I'm also saying ASEAN, I think, is clearly made itself irrelevant, has not really been able to undertake anything of note. The framework of the five-point consensus is there. It's available. Maybe, as we were saying earlier, with the, the possibility of a shift in the strategic calculus of the military through, at a minimum, a change in leadership of the military, might make the framework, the ASEAN framework, five-point consensus framework, relevant. But that is not the only factor, I would argue. It is also the member states of ASEAN, when you think about it, that have, in effect, been unable to coordinate action. And we've seen different cliques, different subgroupings, depending on proximity or perceived stakes, essentially override and undermine any chance of a unified ASEAN response. But again, it's there and available if and when ASEAN wants to return to relevance. At the moment, I do not see it. It's so refreshing for me not to be the ASEAN cynic on one of these, <laughs> on one of these episodes. But <laughs> I think that is all the time we have for this week. Uh, let me thank Nyanta so much for taking the time and Lena, as always, for helping me pilot this thing. And thanks to all of you for listening. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with the next episode of Southeast Asia Radio. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Alina. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of Southeast Asia Radio. Write us with any questions, comments, or feedback at searadio at csis.org, and we'll get back to you. Do us a favor and subscribe and give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever streaming platform you listen to us on. Marla Hiller is our producer, and our interns are Angus Lamb, Corey Donnelly, and Tappy Lung. Our co-hosts today were Greg Poling and Alina Noor. My name is Jaffet Kitson. And I'm Lauren Mai. And we'll see you in two weeks for another episode of Southeast Asia Radio. Southeast Asia Radio.